Previously, we looked at various ways for each can be used to generate dynamic SwiftUI views, but they all had one thing in common. SwiftUI needs to know how it can identify every view uniquely, so it can animate changes correctly. For example, if you conform to the identifiable protocol, SwiftUI will use the ID property of your data as identifier for all its uniqueing. Or if you don't conform to that, you can specify a key path. Use this property or this property for uniqueing. For example, you might say a uh, book's ISBN number. But if you don't conform to identifiable and you haven't got a key path to refer to, then we're often going to fall back to backslash dot self, a special key path meaning the whole object is the identifier. For example, previously, we might have made a list like this one. A list with a for each over the array of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, with the ID of backslash dot self. And inside there, we'll do text string interpolation dollar zero is even. And we'd get a layout like that. 2 is even, 4 is even, 6, 7, uh, 8, and 10 is even, like that. Now, with core data, we can just use an ID property if you want to. That works great. Or you can use an ID of the title of your book, or the ISBN of your book, or the postcode, or who knows what you want to do. An exact field inside the data. But you can also use backslash.self with your NS Manage objects. All those objects we had, like our books, for example, entities, they can also be unique using backslash.self. And when we say this, this special key path, the self key path, we mean the whole object. Use the whole piece of data. But in practice, that doesn't really mean very much. You know, a struct is a struct. It has no sort of specific identifying information other than its contents. There's no identifier attached to it other than what it has inside it. So what actually happens is when we say backslash.self, Swift computes what's called the hash value of the struct, which is a way of representing complex information, maybe megabytes and megabytes of text, for example, summing all it down to a single fixed value that represents the whole thing uniquely. That's what hash value does. Now, there are various ways of making hash values, all sorts of functions out there, but they have the same fundamental concepts behind them. First, regardless of the input size, whether it's five pieces of uh, letters or 5,000 or 50 billion letters, the output should be the fit same fixed size. So like 32 characters is your hash length, for example. No matter if it's, if it's the words hello world or the complete works of Shakespeare, you've got to have a hash value 32 characters long, for example. And second, calculating the same hash for the same object twice in a row should return the same value. It should be predictable. So you can get the same thing. You say, give me hello world, there you go, and you get back the hash value. Do it again, same hash value. Do it again, same hash value again, again, again. Now those two might sound simple, but think about it. If we had the hash of hello world and the hash of the complete works of Shakespeare, both will end up being the same size. The same 32 or 64, whatever it is, number of characters you have, they'll be the same size. And if you, if you think the reasoning through, it should be pretty clear when you have that hash, you can't convert that back to its original, right? The same 32 or 40, whatever hexadecimal letters cannot be unhashed into the complete works of Shakespeare. It's not possible. It's a one way conversion. Now, hashes are very commonly used for things like data verification. For example, if you downloaded an eight gigabyte zip file from the web and you want to check, is this all correct? Did I get all the bytes correctly from the internet? You can compare your local hash against the service hash. You can say, mine is, you know, uh, F312AE9, whatever. What's yours? Oh, it's the same hash. Brilliant. That means my file is the same as yours. That's what it's for. It's really, really good at that. If the two match, the files are identical or basically identical. And obviously, there's a slight risk of collision there, but not a lot. Uh, they're also used with, with uh, dictionary keys and with sets. That's how they get their very, very fast lookup. They compute the hash of the object, say, aha, that's your unique number there, jump to that in memory, bang, that's the answer, pull it out instantly, rather than going through every single item. Now, all this matters because Xcode generates a class for all the managed objects we create as entities in our data model. And it then makes that class 
conform to Swift's hashable protocol, which is a protocol that means Swift can make hash values for an object, in, which in turn means we can use backslash.self. We can ask for a whole hash of a whole object and use that for its identifier. And this is why uh, string and here int also work with backslash.self because they automatically conform to hashable. That's already been done previously. So we can get the hash value for any number like that. Now hashable, the protocol is a bit like codable. If you wanna make a custom type conform to it, then as long as all the properties inside it also conform to hashable, there's no extra work from us. For example, we could make a custom struct up here. We could say there's a struct called student that conforms to hashable. And then they'll have let name be a string, <clears throat> like that. And it's already hashable, because strings are hashable, the student struct is now hashable. We can create a hash value for the whole student struct. And we can go ahead and use it. We could say uh, in our content view, uh, there is a student's array, students, which is an array of a student with the name of, let's do Harry Potter, another student with the name of Hermione Granger. Granger? Not Granger. Is it Iron Granger? I oh, never mind. Granger. Um, like that. And then we could say uh, there's a list of our students with the ID of self and a student coming in and then text student.name. Like that. So use the whole item as an identifier. And you can see, bang, Harry Potter and Hermione Granger both load up correctly. Because ID self will work with hashable data here. If we hadn't made it hashable, then you've got a problem. So it's like, well, I, I, I can't decide what's unique anymore. I can't do that. I refuse to build. Yeah, bang, big red error, right? But we can make student conform to hashable because all its properties, well, its only property, already conforms to hashable. And so, so what will happen is Swift will compute the hash value for every one of its properties. Let name, let house, let test scores, let, I don't know, stuff, 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 stuff. All properties. It'll calculate the hash for every one of these things. And that total hash will be the hash for that student object. Of course, in this instance, if we have two students with the same name, they'll have the same hash value and so hit problems. Just like if we had an array of strings or an array of integers with the same value. If we had a list of, you know, two, four, six, eight, 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 ten, eight bits multiple times, bang, you got a problem. Now you might think this could lead to a core data problem because uh, if we have two core data objects with the same values, they'll make the same hash. You know, two books, the same title and same author and same star rating, whatever, same hash. What are we going to do? And actually, core data does something really, really smart here because it creates for us, alongside the properties we ask, some extra properties we don't see. They're done automatically, including one called an object ID, which is an identifier that's unique to that object. We don't see it really unless you want to dig around for it, but broadly it's done for us by core data. And these are similar to UUIDs, but it makes them sequentially so it can track uh, how many it's made over time, but they're still guaranteed to be unique. So you could use that to uniquely identify core data objects. Even if the other values are the same, that one will be unique. And so this backslash.self, this key path here, will work for anything that conforms to the hashable protocol because Swift will automatically generate the hash for the object, the hash value, the unique identifier for the object, and use that to identify it. That's how it works. And it already works for core data stuff because they conform to hashable out of the box. That's done for us. So if you want to say list of my objects from core data, ID, ISBN, go for it. Use any key path you want or use self. That is also an option. Before I'm done, I'll give you an important warning. When you calculate the hash value for an object twice in a row, you should get back the same hash each time. Whatever it is, given object A, get back hash A again and again and again every time. But calculating between runs of your app, i.e. calculate the hash, then quit the app, then relaunch the app, then recalculate the hash, that is not guaranteed to be the same. So again and again and again, a single app run with the same value, but don't try and save those hash values for later on, 
because they might come up different. <laughs>